Hello everyone and welcome to What The Finance, making finance easy for everyone. Today we are lucky to be hosting ADS as our third podcast guest. ADS trading career started while undertaking a graduate position as an architect. From there, he left his job and decided to start trading full time. Over the past seven years, he has been an early adopter of Bitcoin, been a successful trader, has helped many learn how to trade through Goldmount Academy and has since expanded the company into Goldmount Estates as well as starting his own hedge funds. Ads talks about his trading journey, the major lessons he has learned, thoughts on crypto, and advice for anyone looking to follow his path and open their own funds. As a disclaimer, nothing that we've talked about on the podcast is investment advice. Please do your own research or talk to a professional before investing your own money. It can be risky and you can lose money. So please, as I said, be careful. If you enjoy the podcast, please like, share, subscribe, so we can continue to get guests as great as ads. Hope you enjoy. Ads, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. So uh, the, the first question I was going to ask is, um, when did your interest in trading and finance begin? Like, was there a certain moment that you knew you wanted to be a trader? Or um, It was, well, I was actually a little lost at one point in my life. So when I came out of university, I actually graduated in architecture. Um, when I okay. came out of university, I went into the job uh, in that field as well. And it was at that point I realized, you know what, this isn't really cutting it for me. So I was a little lost trying to find different things to do. And then one day um, an ad came up on my YouTube while I was loading a video, trading two on two. <laughs> I'm sure we've all heard of it, right? And so I looked into it, um, opened an account of my own, um, made some money, lost some money, played around with it. But it was at that point where um, it, it was around that time, let's say, which was about seven to eight years ago now, is when I realized, you know what, um, I need to be doing something else and trading happened to walk into my life at that very point. Yeah, true. So did you, were you an architect while you were sort of learning trading or how did that work? So, um, yeah, I was still working as an architect, but I, I was a graduate architect at that point. Okay. So you know what it's like for um, when people just come out of uni um, they're not paid much. Well, I was, uh, I'll be completely transparent as well. I was only being paid about 2000 a month. Um, mm. You know, coming out of university, that was good at that time. Yeah. Um, or decent. It's, a, it's sort of a decent income in it for, for most mm -hmm. people. Um, but it wasn't really enough for me, kind of the work I was putting in because I was coming to the office at 8 a.m. Um, sometimes I was leaving at 8 p.m. And sometimes I would even have to take my work home to continue it because if there's a deadline that needs to be submitted for the next day i would have to take my work home continue it until it's done yeah true so, yeah i know yeah. i'm trying to get into finance was, and, um, yeah was, i know yeah. i know it's the exact same thing <laughs> just yeah. crazy hours underpaid and you know it's all yeah. just to get to that point where you know you get promoted and then you you'll start making the big bucks and have a work life yeah, yeah. exactly so when i moved full-time to trading is um, so like I mentioned, I was working as an architect at the point. Um, it was about six to eight months down the line um, is when I started really picking up with the trading side of things, learning new things. Um, and I started to notice, you know, a bit of an income from trading as well. Um, that's when, you know, I took it fully seriously and, and left my job, really. True. So that's pretty quick then. So it's sort of seven to eight months after starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I left that job anyway. It didn't mean that I was earning an amazing income to leave my job, but I had to take that step to focus fully on the trading side of things. Yeah, cool. So you sort of just uh, went all in, jumped off the cliff, and you're like, I better, <laughs> better learn how to fly. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So like I mentioned, it wasn't an amazing income, but I needed that time um, to put into trading properly um, <laughs> to make you know, a decent income in the long run in the future because the time I, that my job was taken up was too much. I had to do something, you know, and trading, you know, what it's like in the daytime or London session, New York session is the most active, but that was my busiest time at work. So I had to kind of make a sacrifice in between then. Other, other than that, while I was still working, I was only able to trade, you know, in the evenings where nothing is really ha taking place or at midnight when I'm supposed to be sleeping because I have to wake up at 6 a.m. the next day. So time was really not on my side. So I had to make the decision, not really for the money, but for the time to put in, because I knew the money would come later. Like I said, as soon as I left my job as well, the money wasn't coming in straight away um, for trading. So yeah, I was I struggling think, for a little while. Yeah. 
Because, um, yeah, I think it's one thing if you're half into, the, you know, you're half in architecture and trading, they're just both going to yeah. fail, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, 100%. I totally agree with you. You know, with trading, it is, uh, some people say you can do it here and there. But I believe, you know what, if you want to do it properly, it's like a full-time job. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So, yeah, you just jumped off the cliff and obviously you're doing pretty well now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're with the uh, M60 you were talking about before. But um, my, my next question is, uh, what is the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Um, biggest lesson I've learned is there are, let's say, there are too many, um, there's too many traders and not enough risk managers. Mm. Yeah, um, because when I took my risk management seriously is when everything started going upwards, like rapidly. Not in terms of money, because as you know, if you risk more, you'll make more, yeah? But I was very, very up and down until I learned proper risk management. Only risk, you know, a certain amount per trade. Everybody risk appetite is different. The account sizes that I deal with now, I can only really afford to risk about half a percent less than that per trade. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, so um, the bit, like, like I said, the biggest lesson is, you know, risk management, 100%. Yeah, cool. And was there, were there some really bad trades that you had that sort of made you, you know, learn the hard way? Yeah, definitely, you know, definitely, 100%, man. <laughs> you know what happened? So um, I'll tell you guys a story as well. Not many people know this story. So um, everybody knows about account flipping or you've probably heard about account flipping before. You obviously risk a lot. Um, you stack your positions. And if it goes your way, you flip your account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once I flipped um, a £10,000 account to around £300,000 and then I blew it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that has to be my biggest loss. But at the same time, it isn't my biggest loss because I only put in 10000 of my own money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the second time I did that, I flipped that same 10000 to around 150000 I knew not to get greedy ever again. I had to get it out of my system. And ever since then, I've never done that ever again. And it was at that point, you know, that £150,000, I withdrew, I bought myself a GTR. Um, that's when I started, you know, finances weren't a problem anymore at that point because then I had some reserve capital ready, yeah, for any other decisions I wanted to make. Um, I could go into trades a lot easier. I didn't have to rush into trades. Um, I didn't have to go into heavier lot size trades anymore heavier risky trades anymore because i could relax a little more i didn't have to have that income at the end of the month because i still have a pot here now on the side which i've withdrawn from once and it's still paying me you know anytime i want to take out money from this yeah cool so it gave you it allowed you to have more patience in the market which then allowed yeah. you to be more successful exactly yeah yeah but like i mentioned before that I was blowing, obviously, like £1,000, £2,000, £5,000, £2,000, you know, all the time before that. Um, that was probably due to a few things. One major thing was over trading. The other major thing was over risking as well. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, and then from there, obviously, I'm sort of going to link it to another thing. So you obviously mentor, you know, you do mentoring for some traders. Is that is that the main mistake you see them make or just over um, leveraging? Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, to be honest, main mistake I see them make is over leveraging as well. Um, it's also to back down to risk. You know, as I know a lot of very good traders. And in fact, I do mentor some very good traders. But the, if they just sorted out their risk, they would go from good to amazing. But yeah, it does cause... take time. It does take a few personal lessons in the process, which, you know, I was learning this as well. I was learning how to trade I, I was hearing it all the time use correct risk management but i wasn't listening mm. <laughs> until it you know happened to myself so it dawns me yeah and i think unfortunately we all have to go through those hard lessons to, <laughs> to yeah. actually listen and be like oh wait this is this is important <laughs> yeah 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 exactly yeah awesome man um <laughs> so i know you're quite big into crypto and you uh, i think that's probably one of your big successes um so sort of five years ago or whenever you started looking at it why did you yeah start investing where did you see the value of it so i invested first into uh, i first heard about it at around 2013 when okay. each coin was around in pounds anyway i can remember about 200 pounds per coin mm -hmm. but i didn't invest straight away obviously i was very skeptical there wasn't enough information out there it was just a friend who told me like he does business across borders 
with crypto. He goes, invest in this because my, you know, 10 pounds has turned into like 200 pounds. Yeah. Over a period of time. Now, if you invest in this now, even one year's time, yeah, it will probably turn into, it could turn into anything. It could easily double, for instance. So I was looking into it at that 2013. I didn't jump in. I was still looking into it. He kept asking me every other month or every two months down the line, when you're going to jump into crypto, man, when you're going to jump into Bitcoin. At that point, it was only Bitcoin. Yeah. So when you're going to put some money into Bitcoin, trust me, I'm saying it for your own good. Uh, it was only when I came across an article um, in 2014 online. Um, I can't remember exactly what it is, but Bitcoin had surged about 50%. Yeah. At that point, it was around 400 pounds per coin. Yeah. 400 pounds per coin. And I jumped in straight away. Um, then it went up to about 800 pounds per coin. Obviously that back then I wasn't earning much. So I only had a few grand to invest into Bitcoin. Today, I'm still holding those very coins. <laughs> yeah. So when it hit 800, that's obviously when it doubled my all, all of my money. I was absolutely chuffed. When it, uh, even me and my friend who told me to invest, I remember asking him, do you reckon it's going to go to 1,000? He was like, I don't know, man, I really don't. But, you know, 800 is really high as it is. You might want to take some out or see how it goes. I said, you know what, I'll see how it goes. It's okay, because I don't need that money at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. When it hit a thousand, we all couldn't believe it. We were like, wow, this is probably the best investment of all time. Now look where it is. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy yeah. to think of, uh, yeah, a thousand, sixty thousand now. It's just crazy mm -hmm. to think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sixty thousand dollars per coin. It's about forty one thousand pounds when I last looked at it earlier this morning. You know, from a two thousand pound investment to it's crazy now my investment is probably worth over 500k from something so small like it has to be the best investment of all time but when it comes down to bitcoin i would say it's just that lucky lucky charm yeah you, you owe your friend a lot then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You and you know what yeah when back then when i was speaking to him as well he he had about thirty-seven thousand coins you know that when he first told me to invest yeah and yeah. I said, wow, that's a lot of coins. He goes, no, it's only about 350 pounds. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, right. Is he in the Bahamas or something? <laughs> yeah, now he's, he's done for life. Yeah. <laughs> he's done for life. He withdraws like a coin a week. And he's, he's feeling he's, he can literally relax for the rest of his life, withdraw a coin a week. Yeah, well, I think that's, as you said, it's a bit of luck and just being, you know, having someone who's into it or just seeing that news article that made you invest yeah it's also yeah taking that step as well because like i said everyone has different risk appetites you don't know what to jump into who to listen to um but it all comes back down like i said to your risk appetite and at that point i was willing to lose that two thousand pounds um if it was going to go it was going to go if it was going to grow it was going to grow regardless i was willing to lose that so another advice i can give everyone who's looking to invest as well into anything is make sure you are ready to lose that money so it doesn't matter to you anymore. Yeah, I think that's something very important. And it's the same as over-risking. If you put too much money in and, you know, you're checking your phone every second and you're, you're really stressed about what will happen, you've probably invested too much money. Yeah, 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 definitely, 100%. You know, yeah. um, like I mentioned, before I had that 150K withdrawal, which was my biggest withdrawal at that point, mm. um, before that, I was just over risking and over trading, you know, taking trades that I didn't need to take or risking money that I didn't have to risk in the first place. I was mm. doing it for that desperosity, if you know what I mean. Like, I just kept thinking of returns, returns, returns. Yeah, but I wasn't thinking about the losses that were coming with it. Yeah, definitely. And it's just thinking about that, you know, even if it's just a few percent every week, it just adds up, yeah. doesn't it? Compound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, cool, man. So I know you've sort of diversified as well away from uh, Bitcoin. So if you're looking for sort of other cryptos to invest in, what do you, yep. look, are you look at the fundamentals or what do you look for in particular? Um, I mainly look for volume rather than fundamentals. I've learned not to listen too much to what other people are saying or articles, especially when it comes down to crypto. Um, some could be fake. Even some of the things Elon Musk, you know, has been saying about do dog coin. 
Um, you know, it's just a bit of a hype, really, but it just ended up shooting through the roof. So the best place to look for, if there's a great article that has come out, look at the volume and market cap of the money that is going into that crypto in the first place. Um, I also do a bit of a calculation when it comes down to market cap to make sure that, you know, it's actually worth what it's worth. <laughs> yeah? yeah. So at the same time, um, that calculation I do. So if there's a lot of money being pumped into that crypto, but it's only worth, let's say, 12 pence. Yeah. I do the calculation and the calculation kind of brings me around, let's say, 20 pence. Then I'd invest into that crypto until it hits that 20 pence mark and then I would pull out. Okay, so for a lot of these other altcoins, you're not as much holding them long term. It's more just in term for trading, is it? Yes, mainly for trading. The other two coins that I am holding for long term are Ethereum and uh, Ripple. I do hope Ripple does pull through. Um, currently, today's articles anyway were looking positive, but it's all going to come down to the outcome at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think it's what we were talking about before. You don't, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. You you know, yeah. you're going to stress about Ripple if you've got, if that's the only thing you've invested in, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. See, it's best to split all your money up into, like you said as well, multiple different baskets, um, mm. split up your eggs and you know, one will pay you massively. Even if one goes down, you, you'll make that back from another. Yeah, cool. And do, and do you have sort of any theories about how, uh, you know, what blockchain and crypto will do to the financial markets over the next five, 10 years? Um, I don't so I don't think it will do much to any like foreign exchange currencies. Um, however, I do know that a lot of uh, countries are also developing their own blockchain system. I know a lot of countries are developing their own digital coin as well, um, including the UK, including the US, um, including China. Well, China are probably the most ahead of it right now at this moment of time, Japan, you know, all of these big countries are going to go towards blockchain technology at some point. Yeah. But the only difference is that crypto has a cap of how many coins are out there in circulation. Whereas with money, there is no cap. You know, they can print another 20 million tomorrow. Yeah. With crypto, they, they cannot do that. So supply and demand will still always be in the government's hands when it comes down to normal currency, even if they go digital. Um, however, with crypto, supply and demand is the main driving factor. Yeah, cool. So that's the value of it. Um, so I actually uh, talked to an executive director from a large investment bank, and he was comparing Bitcoin to similar bubbles of the past, so sort of the Dutch tulip bubble, uh, the South Sea bubble, and the dot-com bubble. Uh, yeah. Do you believe this is potentially the case, that it could just all be a bubble and we'll see it crash? Um, it I would say that about four years ago in around 2017, but now I would not be saying that anymore because we've seen it obviously grow even further from that point. We've seen the demand increase. We've seen the usability of it increase as well. So a lot more places are accepting Bitcoin. I've also helped um, some companies onboard uh, Bitcoin transactions as well. So even this garage I'm at, now they accept Bitcoin because obviously I've helped them put that infrastructure into place as well. <laughs> you know, So I've seen it become more usable as time comes along. Yeah. So with the bubble, I don't think that can be the case anymore. It could be a possibility, like I said, a few years ago, around 2017. You remember when Bitcoin just dropped nearly 90% in 2018? <laughs> yeah, we could say it back then, but now we definitely, definitely can't. Yeah, great. So because we've had that, cons you know, it's been around for 10 years now and we have that price history. It's just, yeah, it's too ingrained. Yeah, what, what do you think anyway with it? Um, do you think it's going to be, it's, it's a bubble or do you think now it's really, really holding its ground? And I, I believe it's solidly built its foundations. But yeah, I'd like to hear your um, <laughs> voice on that one as well. Yeah, well, um, I, I do think it's it's definitely here to stay. I, I could see there being a massive retracement to so sort of back to 20K or even lower. Um but, but I think it's here to stay and it's, you know, you see what the, the US is doing with you know, the Fed buying $80 billion of bonds every month and just the amount of printing they're doing. It's just yeah. prime for inflation. It's prime for Bitcoin to take advantage of it. So, you know, it might be in the future, it might get to a million dollars. You know, it wouldn't be that million dollars wouldn't be worth as much as, as it is today, but it's still going to be extremely valuable. So, yeah, I sort of have the same opinion to you. Um, yeah. 
and I just think it, it's just because of what the you know what these governments are doing in terms of uh, printing so much money and you know they're not they're not even very apologetic to it. It's just how it's how the financial system's changed. Yeah. <laughs> it's just how it is. Another thing is um, that I do believe that it's going to be really really strong as well. I also like just like yourself, as you said, you know what um, I see it retracing back to around twenty k. I see exactly the same happening as well because some of these um, companies or big investors need to pull their money out at some point right so because of how volatile it is I've probably seen this as the most volatile asset out there ever <laughs> yeah I've seen it one day hit you know from 300 pounds to a thousand pounds then back down to 500 then back up to like 1500 then back down to 800 like nothing goes up and down that fast yeah, it's a very, very volatile asset. So um, when it comes back down to solidity um, and foundations, I believe, you know what, after the first drop that did happen or the major drop that did happen in 2018, ever since then, they've been working behind the scenes to solidify things, yeah? Build a proper foundation for this next major bull run, which is taking place right now, yeah? They've, like I said, built infrastructure, um, they've sped things up on different places. Um, you know, exchanges are accepting different kinds of currency now as well to buy Bitcoin with. You can use Bitcoin in way, in way more places than you could ever have done so beforehand. And I see it being the future. But another thing you have to remember is these people are developing their, um, so not these people, sorry, every government is developing their technology based on Bitcoin's technology. Now, when Bitcoin came up, it wasn't just a cryptocurrency. It was the technology of the blockchain that Satoshi also created. Yeah, which is now basically a very, very genius idea. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy to think how how it's changed, obviously, yeah. finances in general. Um, mm. And yeah, and it's, it's something that um, I, I do think will have a massive impact on. And it's what you were talking about before in terms of volume. So the higher the volume, the more stable the it is because it's going to be a lot harder for these big institutions to move. And um, I think if you look at, you know, Forex, it's $4 trillion of yeah. uh, liquidity every single day. Whereas yeah. all cryptocurrencies, I think it was $1 trillion for over 30 days. So I think mm. if, you know, similar to what you said, if we see the increasing volume, that will just reduce the volatility and, you know, yeah. hopefully we don't have to live through these massive crashes. And <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And obviously if you see a... Uh, major drop on volume you know okay match do the calculation with market cap match the price and see where it could potentially come down to but yeah it's all about volume with crypto anyway try not to listen to too many articles because it can confuse you as well um just basically look at volume if there's a lot of volume coming in today you know it's going to be going up yeah cool and it's, it's sort of connected to the um, financial markets as well because it's a lot of the volumes during the week that you might see the massive uh, movements on the weekend, but that's mainly because there's just hardly any volume from the institutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. Exactly. Um, so I was going to go on to next in terms of you starting your own fund. So was there sort of what encouraged you to do that, like to start gold mounts? Um, start my own fund. Well, I actually started as an education company. Um, then I had a lot of people who wanted to make money through Forex, but didn't have the time to do it. So they were like, the only person I will really trust with my money is yourself. And obviously I wasn't licensed at the time to do so. So I went through my whole FCA licensing. I'm personally FCA licensed myself now as well. Um, and yeah, it was just at that point, really, I knew a lot of people who wanted to make money from it, but didn't want to do it themselves. Basically the lazy guys. <laughs> but fair enough, you know what? They've built their money in other ways previously. Yeah, they now can be lazy. They have an excuse to be lazy. You know what? Hats off to them because they didn't get to where they are right now by doing nothing. So yeah. they, they, they can be lazy now. Uh, so yeah, I just you know got in contact with quite a few people at that point who wanted to, like I said, raise, you know, build another form of income, but just not put in the time um, to learn to trade or any of that, which was fair enough. I also had went down the other route as well. So I had an education platform, which was Goldmount Academy, I still have that obviously today. And then from there, I built Gold Mount um, Markets, which is our hedge fund. So I gave people two options. You can either sit down and learn yourself or you can just put it in now and we'll do everything for you. 
Yeah, cool. And, and why do you think, um, you know, people chose you to manage your money? There's so many options out there. Why do you think they chose you personally? I think a lot of people, um, yeah, you know, there are a lot of uh, options out there. I've also got a very big network. Um, a lot of people now, um, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Obviously, over the years, it built up over a long time. But yeah, my reputation um, has grown in, in especially around London and West London, especially. Um, so they've also seen my growth in terms of my success as well. So they know, you know what, he wasn't a scammer. He actually did start from nothing. Um, he built it up slowly, slowly. We've seen it over the years as well. He's kind of been logging his achievements here and there. Um, so everybody has seen, you know, where I came from to where I am today. I also didn't come from massive poverty either. So I wouldn't say, you know, I came from absolutely nothing. My parents weren't um, too poor, but at the same time, they weren't too rich either. So they were just normal working class people. So I didn't have a bad upbringing, but I didn't have, you know, like a spoiling upbringing either. I was just like in the middle. So people saw me go from like that in the middle kind of um, success to like starting to step up the mountain. Obviously, I'm still nowhere near where I need to be. Billions is really where I really, really want to be. And I probably won't stop until I get there. But yeah, as time goes along, it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, for, for your 10 year sort of vision, is that where you see just the, the funds growing or do you have any other plans? Yeah, I see the fund growing to, um, you know, hopefully if that figure as well, the billion mark, you know, nine zeros <laughs> <laughs> one day. Um, yeah. yeah, I've also got a few other businesses as well, which, are, which I'm um, involved with as well. So one of my other businesses is Goldmount Estates. So we do a lot of property now it's only because of forex i'm able to do that you know you need to diversify your money in elsewhere so obviously i was doing architecture when i first finished university um, and i was doing it in university but i was always working on other people's houses <laughs> yeah i wanted to start something where i could have the skill to work on my own houses all i needed was the funds so yeah i was growing it through my own trading and obviously profits from the hedge fund as well and I managed to, you know, build another business from there, start buying houses, renovate them, sell them. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I also see that side of things growing heavily. Um, and that's actually my retirement plan, in fact. Oh, yeah. So just um, buying the houses and then what, renting them out? Um, yeah, buying houses, renovating them. So making them uh, the max possible uh, capacity they can get to. Yeah, within within legislation and laws as well, and then renting them out. So obviously the property value goes a lot higher. The rent you can charge also increases and then go for it. Maximizing cool. basically. Yeah, cool, man. I was just gonna ask sort of um for a lot of other people. So myself, I'd love to start a fund, and I'm sure there's lots of other listeners yeah. who'd like to start a fund as well. Um, what advice can you give to us? Like, yeah. I would say look, it's not easy, definitely not easy, because there's a lot of money you're dealing with in the first place um you have to be 100 percent confident that you know what at the end of the day you are still sticking to your rules you are still doing everything by the book because you know what there's so many hedge fund managers um and owners that have been arrested and gone down because you know they've started to do the wrong thing at the end of the day all they're trying to do it for is the commission yeah only jump into it when you are 100% confident in your own skill. Then go for your own license first, yeah, and then start to build your fund from there, yeah. Once you've got your own FCA license from there, then you know what, you can bring other investors on board. You can, you have a proven track record of your own funds growing. But the first step to take, in fact, would just be, I would say, build your own FX book over a long period of time, minimum eight months. Yeah, yeah minimum cool. bare minimum would be eight months to build your fx book from and stick to your rules no matter what if you're going to risk half a percent all the way through don't increase it i know there's some days there are some juicy setups out there <laughs> yeah where like they're pretty much guaranteed where you know you can 10 times your lots and nothing will happen but still do you fca don't care yeah yeah when you're going for your licensing they don't care they, they just want to see your risk. They don't even care how much you're making. Even if you made 4% in a whole year, they want to know how much you're risking and how much you're losing. 
Yeah, perfect. I think the issue is that you can, you know, you have one of those guaranteed and it can work 99 times, but, you know, yeah. that, that one time where it doesn't work, wipe well, basically your whole account is down. Out yeah, point. exactly. Or even if you're just losing, let's say, 10 pips, that could be a massive loss in terms of percentage. It could be, you know, minus 5%, which is quite a lot, especially, you know, when your account sizes start increasing. Yeah, great. So you'd say, obviously, um, you know, make sure that you're profitable, have your strategy, uh, FCA yeah. approval, and you can obviously trade your money more and then take clients on from there. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So build your own track record, um, then go for your licensing. And then obviously from there, you'll have confidence within yourself. If FCA give you that certificate, you know, you know what, well, that's kind of an ego boost as well at the same time. It's a confidence boost. You know, you, you're like, you know what, if these can accept me, anyone can accept me. <laughs> so yeah from there there's multiple directions you can go into you can go into work for another fund build some experience there learn a few things or you can just jump into the deep end like i did um and just make your own fund either way both isn't really a problem yeah and do you, do you have any opinions on sort of more regulation of hedge funds because as you said it's something we've sort of seen a bit more with where some you know hedge funds will just over leverage or they're just doing shady stuff do you think that's sort of necessary Make it more transparent, um, I, maybe? Yeah, I'd say make it more transparent as well. A lot of hedge funds do not really show what is going on behind the scenes. But then again, I understand why. Um, yeah. Because, you know, if your clients know what kind of positions you're in, yeah, they will ask you a million questions as well. How do you know it's going to get to that point? Yeah, or how do you know where you, that is going to get to the take profit area? How do you know this? And then you're dealing with another person on top of all of the things you've already got to deal with in the first place so i understand why transparency isn't the key when it comes down to hedge funds because it does get it builds extra stress for no reason um but i do say just be honest yeah be honest with everybody if you can't deliver don't say you can yeah perfect and i, and I guess that's an issue we've seen in the u.s with um gamestop yeah. where you know people knew that it was being shorter and then there's just been a massive short yeah. squeeze so I guess that's yeah. it's that competitive trying to keep that competitive advantage while mm -hmm. still being transparent. Yeah, yeah, correct, exactly. So, you know, I also another a bit of advice I would give um, for hedge funds as well is keep traders traders. Don't bring them onto like the clients onboarding side of things. Yeah, yeah. and keep the obviously relationship managers and um, those account managers constantly in contact with the clients. Yeah, but don't ever mix the two because when the trader starts contacting clients or clients starts contacting the trader, he loses focus of what he's concentrating on or what he's supposed to be concentrating on. So never really mix the two up. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, concentrate on one thing um, and obviously hire somebody to do the, other, the rest for you. Do you find, because I, I have heard that, um, you know, clients, are, they're actually expecting a lot more from sort of the managers and the people who they talk to, do, do you find that they're expecting more technical knowledge and uh, more understanding of the markets rather than just yeah, being Yeah, I a... find that all the time. I find that all the time, you know. they Some people want to know why um, it's achieved so high on one month, yeah, or we've overachieved on one month and why the next month has gone back to the average, yeah. They always want to know. They want to uh, want to know more. So let's say we had a good month. It's just what the market gives you at the end of the day, though. You can't really... Uh, and then they start expecting that all the time. Does that make sense? When you over um, exceed your expectations, some clients expect it all the time, you know, all, all the time. So you kind of have to build a balance in between the two as well. Um, I found a really good balance anyway is, which should be on everyone's agenda anyway, is um, over... Oh, sorry, under promise and over deliver. Yeah. yeah. So if you're going to be offering, let's say, you know, 50% a year, say you're going to be doing 30% a year. Yeah. And if you end up doing that 60, 70, 80, then that's just an extra bonus. Yeah. So you still got some leeway in between as well. Yeah. And then there's less likelihood that they're going to take, want to take their money out. There from that. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, so, are there any resources? So if I would ask you, you know, is there the book that you've read that's really changed your thoughts about finance or has just really helped you along the way or maybe a mentor? That's a very good question. So I wasn't much of a reader 
um, obviously in my uni days or I had to read books in university. But ever since I finished university, I, I said to myself, I'm never picking up a book again. Now, I was, like I said, I was struggling um, through my job. I was struggling even my first year of trading as well. But somebody um, recommended me a book, Think and Grow Rich, which we all, you know, most people know about. Um, I picked up that book and my mindset had changed forever. That, that is probably the book that changed my whole mindset in terms of success. And, and there's another thing that I also heard from Jim Rohn as well. I see Jim Rohn as also a very good mentor. Um, and one thing he said is, you know what, you can do all the things in the world. You can do all the research in the world. You can even have all the money in the world. But if your mindset is not built for success, you will never be successful. And that's also what it states in Think and Grow Rich. If you're not thinking with a successful brain, success will never come your way. Yeah, you can even jump into Bitcoin at an early stage. But if you haven't got a successful brain, you'll end up pulling out halfway through. Yeah, so Think and Grow Rich is definitely the book that did change my mindset in terms of success. And I would definitely recommend it to anybody. I've read it now about six times, but I, I reckon I will keep reading it over and over again over, you know, the lifetime of my lifespan because it had that much greatness of effect into my brain the other one is um rich dad poor dad that's more about finances hmm. um, that also changed my way of thinking in terms of how money flows and yeah i realized okay you know what you don't just have to be earning and then spending what you're earning you could be doing so many other things you can just spend about 20 percent of it yeah and then you could put your money in other places which will pay you for the next many many years to come yeah, rather than just spending, you know, what you're earning and only saving some away because saving doesn't really go far if you don't have something to save towards. Yeah. If you're saving for, let's just say, OK, nowadays, some people are saving to buy that one Bitcoin, for instance. Yeah. Right now, it's about 40,000 um, pounds, unfortunately. Yeah. Which is fair enough. We can see it going a lot further than that. So it is a good investment still to jump into today. So if some people are saving towards that 40K Bitcoin yeah um at least you have something that you're saving towards whereas some people are just building a savings account a savings pot but don't know what it's going towards and that is where you know you're just literally living every month on a paycheck not knowing where your life is going or where your life is heading and that is where you need to start working it out which way which direction your life is heading yeah and that is where more clarity will come into your savings yeah what am i going to use the savings for like, like i have my retirement plan in place i built a company which is buying and selling houses and renovating and renting houses that is going to be my retirement plan one day yeah or at the end of the day so or the end of my lifetime or lifespan for instance and once i hit that target that's when i can start taking things easier and start to relax start concentrating on kids one day you know <laughs> things like that <laughs> Yeah, cool. So I, I guess it's turning that because I know a lot of people, especially young people, have like a right now mindset. Yeah. It's all about what's happening now. Spend your money as much money as you can, basically whatever you have to satisfy yourself now. So you're sort of it, it helped you look, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ahead. Is that sort of yeah. what it did? Exactly. Yeah, it did help me. Another thing um, people do a lot as well is like like you said as well. You know, end up spending on something silly. Yeah, for instance. They're spending a lot of money on silly things. Like I could have bought um, a Lamborghini, for instance. Yeah. But instead, I would rather use that money to, uh, towards another house. Yeah. And build a car that is going to be faster than a Lamborghini anyway. <laughs> Casual flex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, I've eaten R8s. I can eat R8s all day long now. So they're, they're too slow for me. <laughs> yeah, that's so good, man. But yeah, I know what you mean. So it's rather than, you know, you, you might have that first step of success and then you can mm. just stop there and spend it all, or you can just, be, you know, not be happy with that and be like, hang on, if I keep going and keep reinvesting my money. And I guess that's, yeah. you know, why we've seen Amazon such a successful business now. Mm. They've hardly ever made a profit, but they're the biggest, yeah. one of the biggest companies in the world. So that's sort of how you treat your life, basically. Yeah, like treat your whole life with a compound effect. Like even every action you take, even with time. Oh, this is another thing I noticed as I was um, obviously trying to make it in life. 
I was, you know, I started to network with some really high net worth individuals. And one thing I really learned off them is they value their time very, very highly. Yeah, they value their time more than they value their money. So even an hour that you're putting aside for something, make sure that you're doing something important with that hour. Yeah, because every hour that goes by is another hour that can never be gained back again. We can spend a hundred pounds, but we know we can make a hundred pounds again, no problem. Yeah, but with every hour, that's something you'll never gain back again. So it is the hours that also add up and compound, yeah, to your success as well. Just like money adds up and compounds to your success as well. Yeah, my time does that, but there is no replenishment on time. So you can value it more than you value money. And that is also what helped change my mindset. When I valued my time more than I valued money, that time paid me so much more in return because I was doing more productive things with my time. I was doing more like I was balancing things. Let's just say I was making better choices with my time. Okay, should I instead take an hour out, go grab the Nando's, come back, or should I just quickly put something in the oven? And then I have more time on my hands if I put something in the oven to do more research into other things that I need to do research into. You know, which coins to look into next? You see what I mean? Or, you know, if anybody needs help in terms of the mentoring side, I have that extra time to help them out. Rather than, you know, going Nando's, waiting there for a little while, placing my order, chilling around, and then coming back. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously we're in a takeaway day and age. <laughs> That's the kind of things we need to do nowadays. <laughs> Just got so, Uber now, it's, uh, so you can, you can have yeah. Nando's without worrying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now Uber's become so fast. That's another company I definitely see growing to multi, multi billions, if not, well, it's already at multi billions, but I reckon it can probably grow at least another five times bigger than it is. Wow. And you think that's um, due to the autonomous vehicles in the future and how that will, is that yeah. what you're thinking? Also because of that and their time, they value time as well. They don't like, out of all the delivery services, I've seen Uber to be the most efficient. And in business, it is all about efficiency. It's about money efficiency and time efficiency. So they cut down the time the fastest. Yeah, they get your food delivered to you as fast as possible. Plus, it's probably the cheapest in terms of, well, it's not really the cheapest in terms of delivery, but you get extra savings on there and things like that. So how they see it is if we can help save time, we can make more orders. We can get more orders done. We can get more deliveries done. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's like, like economies of scales way. and the compounding effect is, you know, we're, we're linking it back to everything. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Cool, man. So you sort of talking about that you were hanging out with, you know, high net, uh, net worth individuals or just, you know, people yeah. who are very knowledge, knowledgeable in finance. Um, for other people, yeah. maybe like myself, who don't have many yeah. connections, what, what would yeah. you recommend to build our network? Um, I would, I would say... Just keep, um, that's a hard one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard one, actually. Um, yeah, if, you know, just keep honest with everybody. Um, keep in contact with everybody at the same time. Always check in with them. Obviously, if you're going to start contacting high net worth individuals, um, contact them not so often or they will, get they will start to get annoyed with you. But also at the same time, they're not really annoyed with you. They just have a busy life at the end of the day as well. Yeah, they also have a busy life, uh, except their space. Yeah, but as soon as you can get in, let's say even 10 minutes with a high net worth individual, ask as many questions as you can straight away. Yeah, like learn from them, ask them, what is your trick to success? Or can you name me three things? That's what I used to do as well with successful people. I always used to ask, can you, what are the top three things you can prioritize towards success? Yeah. And they always used to answer, you know, time, um, education, reading, family. They, but a lot of them say family is very important. I also believe that towards myself as well. Like without my family, I would be nothing. And without myself, they would probably be nothing as well. So family at the end of the day is nothing to do with money. Yeah. It's all to do with your heart. Yeah. And your heart, you know, reflects on the outside. You know, if you're building a good family life at home, that will reflect on the outside. Everything else will turn more positive as well. Yeah, so having that balance will mean that you'll be more successful in training and in everything in general, yeah. that balance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And obviously, if you're having a bad family life or going through a little bad patch, 
you could also go through a little bag patch in other things in life. So your trading might take extra hits, you know, because you're not thinking properly. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Okay, perfect. So um, sort of at the last question now, so what adv advice would you give to traders just trying to get to the next level? If you could give them, I know you've given us so many gems throughout this podcast, yeah. but if you give them just one piece of advice that they can take away, what would it be? Yeah, that's a good question, in fact, and I uh, get asked this a lot. And uh, my answer is always the same. Yeah. Find a strategy that works for you. <laughs> yeah. Because my strategy may not work for yourself, Anthony. Yeah. Mm. Your strategy may not work for myself. You know, my partner uses moving averages. Unfortunately for me, moving averages isn't really my thing, but they work very, very well for him. Yeah. But for me, they don't work. So find a strategy that works for you and just consistently work at that very same strategy. Don't start changing things. Don't start adding things. Like if I added moving averages into my strategy now, something may go wrong. Yeah. And I may have to go back all the way to the beginning again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, hold on. Let me just move my car. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Blocking That's someone. Um, so, yeah. Strategy. If you have a, if you found or worked on a strategy of your own, yeah, stick at that very same strategy forever. Yeah, just tweak it a little bit. Yeah, improve it a little bit, but don't ever move away from that very strategy. Yeah, because every single strategy works. It's all about how consistently you are doing that strategy. Even you know what? Even support and resistance works. If you're just trading support and resistance and you have a good risk management, yeah, one to three, one to four, one to five, yeah, one to three, one to four, one to five, you know, you'll consistently smash it. Obviously, there are times where you're not going to make money on it. And as long as your risk management is fine, you, you'll, be, you'll be good because, you know, the next three, four trades are going to go in your favor anyway, and you'll be completely fine. Like I said, even the simplest things like, support and resistance works but are enough people working the strategy is the question yeah because it's all about if other people are doing it then that will work that means it'll work because it's all about that yeah, yeah the psychology cool yeah. i'm sorry i know i know you've uh, got to get off but if i can ask one more um mm -hmm. so you're yeah, saying yeah, that yeah. It, it's about finding the strategy that works for you um yeah. there's so much information out there so many marketers how do you sort of that like um let's say filter out all the information or news to find the right stuff to listen to the right strategy okay it's all about trial and error as well so you can't learn to become a trader over you can learn everything in six months but you can't become a profitable trader in six months because you haven't got enough you know experience in the markets you haven't had enough months you haven't taken enough trades to know okay is this strategy working for me and don't just test it over one trade yeah Test that strategy over a few trades, for instance. Yeah. Test it over the next five to six months and see how well it does for you. Yeah. It's only at that point that then you will realize, okay, this strategy works for me. Um, it ticks all of my boxes. I hope flames don't fly up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it ticks all of my boxes. And yeah, this strategy works for me. Now, as soon as you find that strategy that does work for you, stick at it. Now, that is where consistency goes wrong with people because trading is all about consistency. Now, consistent results will only come from consistent inputs in the first place. If you're inputting the same strategy every day consistently, eventually your results will turn out positively and consistently, right? But if you're not even consistently using the same strategy, yeah, you're not going to consistently have a good income. And it's that simple. What you input is what is going to come uh, on the output. Perfect. Ads, thank you so much. Really appreciate you spending no time with us today. Um, if anyone wanted to learn more about you or get in contact with you, how would they do that? Um, so my Instagram is um, ads5. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. I'm not very consistent on it because I've just been so busy with my other businesses as well. I'm trying my best, but yeah, hopefully when I go back to filming again, um, my YouTube channel is Ads Luxury. I do share a lot of, you know, just general life, good stuff, mindset stuff on there, a lot of crypto knowledge, especially all for free anyway. You know, crypto, I don't have a course on. I give that knowledge out for free. Um, I was given the opportunity to invest in crypto for free, so I don't see 
the need to charge anyone else for my knowledge in that. With Forex, obviously, I've taken a few courses which I've had to pay for. So that kind of knowledge I do charge for. But other than that, Ads5 is my Instagram. Ads Luxury is my YouTube. So yeah, check check us out. Check myself out. Drop me a message. I'm willing to give out any advice. Perfect. And uh, co-host for Capital Combos as well, which I really yeah. like. Another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, we're going to jump back on from it next week. Um, a few of us have been you know, busy doing other stuff as well. So yeah, from next week, we're jumping back on Capital Combos. So anything you can suggest as well, just drop me a message and, you know, we'll bring that topic up in our Capital Combos. And obviously any, any of you uh, guys watching as well, anything that you guys suggest, just drop us a message um, of what you would like for us to talk about in our Capital Combos and we'll definitely bring that subject up. All right, perfect. Ads, thanks, thanks again. And really appreciate you giving us the time. No worries. Thank you for having me, Anthony. Thank you very much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed. If you have any feedback on what we could do better, or if you know anyone who you think would be great guests, please write them down in the comments. Otherwise, thank you so much. Like, subscribe, and hope to see you in the next one. Cheers.